Good evening, everyone. It's really awesome to see you all here. Uh, obviously, we love seeing you and you, seeing you enthusiastic about birds, about wildlife, about nature, about the environment, and about farming, okay? Because that's all the stuff you're going to get to learn uh, while we're here this weekend. And we really appreciate that you came here tonight because we have Kaylee Swift, and she's um, a bird specialist. Is that a reasonable way to put it? And she just told me tonight that while she's spent time in the Seattle area and is teaching a class at the university in the Seattle area for spring, her home base now is in the northern Mariana Islands and uh, with a special bird there. And she's going to tell you all about it, but I have always been fascinated with islands. So as the moment she told me that, I thought, oh, there's got to be special stuff there. And she's going to tell you more. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, I also want to extend another level of gratitude to you all. Um, as I look out in the audience, the level of community care that I see from everyone who um, is acknowledging and participating in my mask request, I deeply appreciate it as I stay with my very sensitive family members while I'm teaching this quarter. Uh, that said, I'm going to take mine off so that you can hear me more clearly during the talk. Uh, I just took a PCR test this week, so if anyone else is nervous, don't be. But uh, that said, I am so excited to talk to you guys tonight about crows, though after the talk, you are more than welcome to ask me anything you want to about the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm out there as a postdoc studying the Tinian monarch, which is a monarch flycatcher and not a monarch butterfly, uh, as a lot of my family still think that it is. <laughs> um, but for now, let's focus on crows. So in general, the way I like to start these talks is going back to the basics, which is crows and ravens. What's the deal? Are they different? How are they different? Because this is actually a really common question, even among birders, and I make no assumptions about the backgrounds or uh, skill levels of anyone in the audience. In fact, I hope some of you are new enough to the birding game that you're still learning this kind of stuff, because that is so exciting for me as a birder and naturalist, is to see new people to this um, really wonderful uh, way to engage and, and learn about the world. So, to answer the question, crows and ravens, taxonomically speaking, they have the same relationship as like lions and tigers. They are in the same genus, but they are different species. And in fact, there are many different species of crows and ravens around the world, about 45 all told. Now, here in Washington, you're only going to encounter one kind of each, either the common raven or the American crow. Historically, if you moved up north a little bit, you might also encounter the Northwestern crow, though that was absorbed by the American crow based on genetic evidence and also a lack of defining ecological differences a few years ago. So the two main species we have out here, again, is the common raven and the American crow. And the, the, I would say the biggest uh, visual difference between these two birds is size. Common ravens are about two and a half times the size of an American crow. And if you're coming from the city where you're used to seeing a lot of crows, I tell people if you're ever out, you know, you're driving out to eastern Washington, you're going more to wildland areas, Mount Rainier, and you see something and you think, oh my god, that is the biggest crow I've ever seen in my life, then you're looking at a raven. If, on the other hand, you're used to seeing ravens, sometimes it's a little harder to make that distinction. But Yes, these birds are huge. In fact, common ravens are the biggest songbird in the world. And yes, if you did not know that, crows and ravens are in fact songbirds. And their closest uh, relatives, the next closest group, are the birds of paradise, which always gets me. But it's true. 
Uh, in general, you're going to find ravens more out in wildland areas as opposed to living in cities, though that's not a hard and fast rule. There's actually very robust breeding populations of ravens in even places like downtown LA and San Francisco. So they are birds that can do really well in the city, but generally speaking, they tend to be more out in the woods, crows are more in the city, and that lifestyle is reflected in their diets. So ravens are more carrion specialists, eating a lot more meat. Crows, on the other hand, about 50% of like an urban crow's diet is insects, and the other 50% is, perhaps no surprise, garbage. Now, if you were to see a photograph of these birds or get a good look at uh, one in your binoculars, there's a couple field marks I want to alert you to. So, on the raven, they have these specialized elongated throat feathers called hackles, and they can articulate them. In fact, they have a much higher degree of articulation on their whole head relative to the crows. That's why you sometimes see ravens kind of put up little horns, almost like a uh, great horned owl. Not quite that dramatic, but they can, they can really kind of puff them up. And crows, uh, you know, they can puff, but it isn't the same level of articulation. And it's a little bit hard to see in the photos up here, but crow throats in general, they're just mo smoother, more kind of fine and hair-like in appearance rather than that heavy Merlin beard. If, on the other hand, you're seeing a bird in flight, the best feature to look for is the tail. Crows have a really distinctive square or rounded tail shape, while ravens have that really distinctive wedge. Though depending on how much the bird is flaring its tail, maybe it's about to land, they can play tricks on you, but in general this is a really good tip. Um, there are also some differences in their social behavior. So ravens you'll typically mostly see in pairs versus crows you'll more often see in groups. But ravens are also incredibly social, particularly when they're juveniles, and so you can see them in big groups as well. All right, so now that you've had a little bit of practice, and some of you, when you were at the table, I warned you there was going to be a quiz. Uh, I want to play a little game, because it's evening time, end of the long week, we're a little tired. I want to make sure you guys are, are, are pepped up for the talk. So we're going to play a little game that I've been playing um, online for, oh my gosh, probably seven years now. <laughs> it's been a long time, called Crow or No. And this game was born out of me when I'd go on Facebook and I'd go to my crow uh, enthusiasm groups or I would just see people sharing bird pictures in the various birding groups I was part of. I would really routinely see folks getting the IDs wrong. And part of that is because it can be much harder to ID a bird in a photograph than in real life because you don't have the cue of vocalization. You only have that one, you know, frame in which to get all of the details that you can have. So it's, it's actually quite the challenge. So for this game, I'm going to show you four pictures. I'll give us a, a little while to look at each one, and then we'll go over the answers. Now, the rules of the game are very simple. All you have to do is look at the photo and decide if the bird has the word crow in its recognized English common name. So American crow, fish crow, etc. These photos can be of a bird of any age, and they can be sourced from anywhere in the world. All right, here is our first photo. Okay, how brave of an audience is this? Do people want to give me a little show of hands? What do you think? Crow? Raven? Okay, oh, half and half. All right, how about number two? Crow or no? Number three, crow or no? All right, we're going to see how you guys are doing. Last one, crow or no? Crow? Okay, well, I think mostly crow on that one. All right, let's go over the answers. Number one, this one was about half and half, I think. This was a common raven. So well done to those who got it. If you didn't get it, I don't blame you. This was a horrible photo. Why did I give you this photo? Uh, you can kind of see the hackles right there in the corner, but the bird is facing away from you, so it distorts the proportions of the bill a little bit, but you can still see that really thick, heavy bill that's uh, indicative of a raven. Our next bird was a resounding no crow, and honestly, well done. 
This is a juvenile rook. This always, I was shocked that so many of you got this right. This one almost always gets people. And the reason for that is how many folks in the audience know what a rook is? Oh, not very many of you. So if you go to England, you'll see them everywhere. They're a very distinctive looking bird because as adults, see how this bird has feathers right there? It kind of has like a little mustache. So that's a really uh, indicative feature of the Corvus genus. All of the crows and ravens have those feathers. They're called rictal bristles. They're these very specialized hair-like feathers, and they all have that mustache, with the exception of one and a half species. And the reason I say one and a half is because rooks, as you can see, that first year have that little mustache like all the other crows and ravens. But after their first adult molt, they lose those feathers, and they get this really distinctive white, chalky look around their bill. And I bet if you saw a picture of a rook, and I should have put one in here, but I didn't, I bet if you saw one, you'd go, oh yeah, I've seen, I've seen illustrations, or I've seen that bird before, and you may just not have realized that it was a kind of corvid but it in fact it is. Now the reason that we think rooks lose those feathers, if anyone's curious, is that they are one of the most insectivorous, meaning insect-eating uh, corvids, and so they spend most of their time probing into the dirt. And so we think it's just a byproduct of, it's so hard to keep those feathers hygienic when that's your main source of food that they just lose them. All right, number three was a resounding no crow. <sighs> Oh no, dang it. So this is, this is another horrible photo I gave you just to be a mean, you, you, you're wondering probably what my, my students think of me, now you know. Um, so this is a large-billed crow. This uh, species is native across Asia. They were formerly known as the jungle crow, but we split them and so this is the, the main one. Very raven-like, but one of the big differences, it lacks those hackles and the upper mandible is much more humped. It's much more curved. So this is the kind of nuance that, you know, most birders, it just takes so much practice to get good at this. It's no wonder that looking at a photo like this can so commonly mislead people. And so it's really my pleasure to be able to help people grow those skills if they're interested in doing that and grow a deeper appreciation of the world's various corvid species. And our last one was, I think, uh, mostly vote for yes for crow. And indeed, you're right, this is an American crow, but this crow is expressing something called um, leucism. And specifically, we would refer to this as the brown type mutation. And believe it or not, this is actually the most common color aberration that affects birds, even though it may not be the most familiar in terminology. I think we're generally more familiar with albinism, but that's actually extremely rare relative to what's called the brown type mutation. One interesting thing, if you see these birds, which if you live in the Seattle area, you, you might. We have a couple that are very well known around the city, is that it's sex linked. So it's almost exclusively females that express this color aberration. Their offspring most often do not. So I want to tell you a little bit more about this bird. Um, like I said, this is the most common uh, color morph, color aberration that we see in birds. And in my opinion, this is a, this, they're very beautiful. <laughs> I uh, coined this term caramel crows because I just think they have this beautiful, it looks like you know, when you pour milk into your latte, just this really unique and beautiful coloration that makes them very eye-catching. And this particular bird in these photographs is named Ferdinand, and I named her after the park that I first spotted her in. And Ferdinand, is a little bit of a celebrity now. So after I first detected this bird and started writing about her on my blog, I encouraged people, I didn't give her exact location, but I encouraged people in the Seattle area that if they saw her to you know, tweet me or, or post an Instagram story and tag her in found Ferdinand. And every once in a while I go and I check that hashtag, and to my surprise, people keep doing so. And uh, to me, that says something very meaningful about the way that we connect not only with, you know, interesting crows, but crows in general. Because the reality is, it's not just Ferdinand that's famous. It's really crows in general. There's no other wild animal that I think so consistently captures our attention as the crows. So some of you may remember this story of a crow that knew a couple uh, four-letter words and was just really excited to share them with some elementary school students in Oregon who were equally excited for the adventure. 
uh, that made the headlines a few years ago. Uh, you may know this story uh, about folks who claim to create crow armies or crow bodyguards that protect them from their neighbors. Sometimes uh, the person is grateful that they do this. Sometimes it becomes a little bit of a problem. It's not always a welcome source of protection. Uh, but this is a really common story I see float around the internet. Um, you may have seen this viral story a few years ago of the uh, bodybuilding crow. And if you haven't, the most important thing is, if we look down here, you can see that this received over 200,000 likes on Twitter. Like, what animal gets 200,000 likes on Twitter? It's, it's amazing. Or you might be more familiar with this story of a family who claimed that they had been feeding crows in their backyard for a long time, and the crows had started gifting them. But it wasn't just that they had started to bring them gifts. This family claimed that the crows were actually bringing them art. And so the way that they described it is the crows were finding these uh, pop can pull tabs, threading them onto these um, spruce twigs, and dropping them off where they were routinely fed. And again, you can see these stories are incredibly popular. I mean, there was a bunch of new, Ar Audubon wrote an article, uh, I think it was in the Times, like these stories just take off like wildfire because there's something about these birds that resonates with so many people. And so part of what I wanna explore in this talk is why that is. What is it about these birds that we connect with so deeply? So to start, I want to establish some basic tenets of their natural history, because I think it's this that really sets the framework to answer this question. So the first thing is that these birds are very long-lived. The first year is pretty dicey. Only about 50% of uh, each batch of fledglings will survive. But if they can make it past those first couple of years, their survivorship jumps up quite significantly. And living to upwards of 14 years old is not that uncommon. Now, where this really comes into play is that in addition to this, they're off, they're, they are also quite territorial, particularly in Washington. So what that means is if you have a pair of crows that sit outside, you know, sit on the tree or the telephone pole outside your home or where you work, and you see them there consistently, it's probably the same two crows every day. And it might be the same two crows for more than a decade. So if you start watching those birds, unlike, you know, when you put up a bird feeder and you get the chickadees or you get the Anna's hummingbirds, anything like that, which I, I love and I find so much joy in that activity, with crows, you're watching and learning individuals on an incredibly intimate level that's really hard to capture with other forms of bird watching or bird feeding. Now, there are definitely exceptions to that, but I think for the average person, that level of intimacy is really only attainable through crows, especially for folks who live uh, in the city, in the hardest cities in particular. And the reason for that is that crows are, uh, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but crows are what we would call a synanthropic species. So there are some birds like robins and juncos that when we tear down forests and we construct suburban neighborhoods or, or put cities up, they're like, okay, well, this isn't my favorite, but I can make this work and, and I'll live here happily. And we would call those urban adapters. But a synanthrop is an animal that's like, no, no, no. It's not that I'm gonna make this work. This is literally what I seek out. You have created the environment that I like best. Crows really actively seek out the ways that we modify the habitat because we modify it in a way that suits them quite nicely. They like our lawns. They're one of the few wild animals that can utilize the industrial lawn, which if anyone in the audience is wondering, how can I do better by the birds and by wildlife, get rid of your lawn, replace it with native species. But until you do that, at least you can take comfort in knowing that you are supporting crows because they, like I mentioned before, they eat a huge, a huge portion of their diet is insects. So you'll see them, you know, marching across your lawn, right, looking for bugs. And in Seattle, actually, we have a big outbreak of an invasive beetle called a chafer grub. So you may have seen pictures or experienced this yourself or your friends or family of big tufts of turf getting ripped out. And that's why, because there's this huge, delicious grub that's now under everyone's lawns. And the crows and the raccoons and the possums have all figured this out. And they're more than happy to just shred your lawn looking for them. But they love that, right? But the other thing they really like about people is, in general, you know, we like our lawns. 
but we don't want to, and we'll tear down trees, you know, to put up our houses, but we don't want to cut down all the trees. We like having a few, right? It makes our neighborhoods beautiful. And the crows love that because that's where they'll put their nests. So as long as you have a nice lawn, a couple trees, they have their source of food, they have their nesting habitat, and then of course, cherry on top is the very predictable weekly uh, buffet service that we put out in the form of our garbage cans. So that is just a perfect, perfect crow utopia. And so they are more than happy to live very, very closely to us, even uh, for those of us who live otherwise pretty far away from more um, natural areas. And then the last feature that we're going to go into a little bit more detail is that um, they share, their social dynamics are, are shared by many of us and very familiar to a lot of us. And that makes watching and learning about these birds a much more, um, it's just kind of a lower bar. A lot of animals, you watch them and you have to have, a, you know, some degree in wildlife, uh, animal behavior, wildlife biology to interpret their behavior, but with crows, a lot of it is pretty self-explanatory. So now I want to go into some of these in a little bit more detail. So like I said, these birds are more than happy to be around people, and so what that means is that they are very visible. Part of that is their proximity to us. The other part, though, is of course their size. <laughs> They're very easy to see. You don't need to have nice binoculars or a spotting scope or travel great distances to see these birds. You can just see them right out your window. And in fact, sometimes you can see a lot of them. And that, unfortunately, can be very alarming to people because, and I heard the chuckles in the audience, this image has been cemented into the Western mind. And oh, gosh, I just, Hitchcock, I I know that he really liked these birds, but he probably did one of the most singular sources of disservice to these animals of anybody in the history of the world. Because in producing the birds, he communicated this idea that large groups of birds are inherently threatening and ominous. And that's a big problem for the Crow PR team. Because as it happens, gathering in large numbers is kind of just one of the things that they do. Oh, I don't know if I can, can I play a video from here? Great. So this uh, video was taken at the UW, oh, good, thank you. I'm just gonna talk over the audio, but that's, that's great, thanks so much. Um, this video was taken at the UW Bothell campus. And this is what a typical September to February night looks like up there. And what you're seeing is the nightly uh, micro-migration of about 15,000 crows as they leave the territories that they maintain uh, during the daytime to all go sleep in a, basically a big communal slumber party called a communal roost. And these roosts can be small or they can be really massive like this. And for a lot of folks in Seattle, you know, they're used to it, but for people who are new, or especially when these kinds of videos go viral on the internet and people are seeing them who aren't used to this, their first reaction is, there must be an earthquake. Something is wrong, the birds know something, what is happening, this is dangerous. And it's always sort of heartbreaking for me to see those kinds of reactions, not because, you know, the idea that animals can um, understand things about, you know, impending dangers in the world, because that is true, but because it demonstrates a really vast disconnect that so many people have with some really basic natural phenomenon. So why don't we take this opportunity to learn a little bit more about roosting? So like I said, these uh, uh, groups can be anywhere from you know, a couple birds to the many hundreds. In fact, the largest roost in the US on record was over 300,000 birds in Danville, Illinois. Unfortunately, at the time that this uh, roost was hitting its peak, it was before the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which does in fact include crows in it. And so when the local people decided they didn't like this roost that much because they were worried it threatened agricultural practices, the city blew it up with dynamite. So we can't do that anymore, but unfortunately, roosts have never quite been the same after Danville. And so the function of these uh, group gatherings is a couplefold. One, 
And this is probably the main one. It's a really effective anti-predator strategy. You can imagine that sleeping in a group at night, much safer than sleeping on your own. Now, there's probably a lot of uh, social functions that come along with these, and to be honest, there's so much about roosting we have not unpacked. Like, do they sleep in the same spot every night? Do they sleep with the same birds every night? We don't actually think that they sleep with their families. Crows, um, before they go to the roost, uh, gather in what are called pre-roost gatherings. They're often in construction sites. Um, in Bothell, you'll see them, they gather right in downtown Bothell, and it seems like they go to the roost with, ever, with whomever they were hanging out with at the pre-roost aggregation, which is often not actually their mates. But um, there's so much to unpack there, because maybe that was true in just the one place they've done that study, but is not true in Seattle, or wouldn't be true in New York. Uh, and I like to remind folks, particularly uh, the young people who are in the audience who might be interested in pursuing careers in wildlife science that even the most visible stuff, the stuff that you're like, oh, I bet we've, we know everything about that. No, there's so much that we don't know, even about these really abundantly studied birds. The next feature that I think is really compelling to us is that they exhibit really familiar behaviors. Again, behaviors that I think are easy for a lot of people to interpret and relate to. And the one that I know the most about is their funeral behaviors, because that's what I studied for six years at a graduate, as a graduate student at the University of Washington. So when I say their funeral behaviors, what I mean is that when crows discover a dead crow, they alarm call, and that recruits other crows to the area. They'll stay up mostly in the treetops, alarm calling, kind of doing their thing for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then they disperse. And so when I started grad school, we knew that. And in fact, people have known that and been discussing it for centuries. That, that wasn't anything that I was contributing. There's references to ravens uh, being the teachers of burial in the Quran, for example. So this is a, a very well-known thing to people. But my interest was in asking some testable questions. And one of the things I really wanted to know is, what is the adaptive value of this behavior? Because the thing about it is doing something that conspicuous is costly. So when I put my scientist hat on, the way I have to look at this behavior is, if it comes at a cost, then its benefit must outweigh what that cost is. So what is its benefit? And I want to be clear, there are many ways that we could explain why crows have funerals, right? It could be that it's random, it's a coincidence. It could be that they are expressing grief and condolence for the lost bird. It could be that they're hungry and want to eat it. Maybe they want to learn about danger, right? There's lots of explanations, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. But not all of those questions are things that I can test. I can't test if a bird is sad, because I can't ask it but I can test if they're using these dead birds as cues of danger. And so that's what I focused my studies on. And part of the reason I was specifically interested in that is because there was some um, evidence that that was the case in scrub jays from some other studies that had been done. So I wanted to do a series of experiments that would test this specifically in crows. The next thing I wanted to know is whether or not they were paying attention to context. Because if you dive into the literature about how different animals respond to their dead, and when we look particularly at those very social, large-brained animals like the apes, the dolphins, the elephants, we see that their responses are incredibly variable. It's been one of the reasons it's so hard for us to sort of pin down different explanations. And we think one reason that they might be variable is because they change what they do depending on the context of the situation. So I wanted to look at that specifically in crows. And then the last thing I looked at was their brains. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. So the first thing I wanted to ask is, again, are they using these crows as cues of danger? Now, if you're looking at this picture and thinking, obviously, look at that lady. Of course she's a cue of danger. What are you talking about? Just bear with me for a second. I'll get there. I'll get there. But... Um, so specifically, we knew going into this study that crows are very good at recognizing human faces, right? So utilizing that knowledge, I wanted to know if crows see a novel predator, meaning a person they had never seen before handling a dead crow, would they use that experience as a cue that that person is a threat and treat, treat them as such moving forward? The next thing I wanted to know is do they make associations with the place that the crow died? 
So the way that I tested that is I would feed crows over the course of three days. That gave me a baseline for how quickly they would come down to the food. Then on our fourth day, we would have our funeral event. So I'd have a masked volunteer go out and just stand there, or d'oeuvre plate style, holding the dead crow. And then we would continue to feed them over the next three days and look at whether or not their willingness to come down to the food changed. And we would also reintroduce this person, and we did it at variable times, uh, now without the dead crow, to see if they had any you know, response to them. And what we found is that the answer to both of those questions was yes. Not only did they, if they saw this person again, would they treat them like a predator, and they would continue to do so for at least six weeks, uh, but they also were extremely wary in the places where these uh, funerals had happened, even if there was you know, no trace of the dead bird there anymore. They were much slower to come down to those food piles. So that gives us some sense that, yeah, they might be doing other things with these events, but they are certainly paying attention to where they find dead crows and using that experience to inform their decision making as they move around their environment. If you want to know more about this study, and there was a lot more that I didn't share here, um, all of my papers are available for free on my blog. So for the more uh, jargon-minded in the audience, you're welcome to parse the dry writing if you'd like. The next thing I wanted to know is what they're attentive to. Because if they are using dead crows as cues of danger, the next logical step is that they should be able to scale how dangerous something is. And I told you at the top of the talk that juvenile crows, uh, they don't, so their survivorship is much lower than adults, right? It's only about 50%. So we would expect that if they saw a dead kid in the breeding season or the non-breeding season, that they would have a more muted reaction, a weaker reaction to that relative to an adult, because this isn't so surprising. But this, a bird whose survivorship is about 80% from year to year, that means something really dangerous is in the neighborhood. Or at least, in theory, that's what it should mean to the birds. So we tested that by putting out um, these different carcasses, which in case anyone is wondering, uh, we, only, we exclusively tested unfamiliar birds in all of our experiments. So that does leave the open question of whether or not their responses are different if they know the birds. But for reasons that I'm hoping you'll understand, I had no interest in shooting partners of crows and turning them into taxidermied birds to use for these experiments. So all of our birds were um, naturally sourced from the environment. Meaning they were like, you know, roadkill birds, or just, just be very, very clear. <laughs> we did not kill any crows for this experiment. And indeed, we found that crows do pay more attention to adults than they do juveniles, uh, particularly in the breeding season where their responses to things are more constrained because they're busy taking care of their kids. The last thing I looked at was what is going on in their brains. And this was kind of my back alley way to try and answer this question of emotion, because I love these birds. I want to know the answer to that question, just like everybody else does. And I recognize how emotionally intelligent these animals are. So the way that we conducted this study, we have a really cool procedure at the UW um, that's one of the only non-surgical, non-lethal uh, brain imaging techniques that exists. So what we do is we would capture crows from the wild, we keep them in our aviaries for a few weeks, and then on test day, we would bring them into our pet lab. We would, uh, they'd be in their little mini cage. We'd show them whatever the stimulus was. It's kind of hard to see in this, in this image, but this is one of our mass people presenting a dead crow to our bird. And then we would give them a glucose mimic that has a radioactive tracer attached to it. It's the same thing that you would get if you ever have to get a, a tumor you're getting a PET scan for a tumor or something like that. And then we can anesthetize the bird and put it in a specialized PET scanner. And what that scanner does is it picks up where that tracer uh, landed 20 minutes ago while the bird was looking at our stimulus. So it's a retroactive way to look at what was, what's going, what was going on in the brain of a bird that's currently asleep but was awake a little while ago looking at something. And then we can use this subtractive method to figure out what part of their brain is most active. Because the idea is, when they see this uh, stimulus, a certain part, a particular part of their brain is going to work the hardest to process that information. And if it's the emotional center of the brain, we would expect that to be the amygdala. So that's going to concentrate that chemical, and we'll be able to see that in the images later. 
And what we found is that that wasn't the case, which kind of surprised me. It was actually their prefrontal cortex, or the Bur-Avian analog to the prefrontal cortex, that was most often activated. And at first, that really surprised us, but then when we looked back at the behaviors we'd seen from the previous experiments, it made a lot of sense, because clearly, these birds are analyzing quite a bit of information in these experiences, and using that to inform exactly how they respond and what that looks like. Now again, would this have been different if we presented them birds that they knew? Perhaps so. Now, the next feature of these birds that I think is worth discussing is that they're obnoxious. I love them, but they can be very irritating. Uh, this is a, an email that I get not infrequently of somebody saying, please help me. I, I, when I was, um, you know, I, I had a crow and it was harassing my dog, and so I threw a rock at it, and now they won't leave me alone. Or I accidentally I, I saw a fledgling crow, and I was trying to help it, so I picked it up, and now its parents won't leave me alone. What do I do? And the thing is, is crows very good at facial recognition, right? The other aspect of these birds is that, uh, much more than elephants, they really never forget a face. So when you get on their bad side, this can be a very long-lived uh, affair. And this in particular, this experience is one that, that I think uh, impacts a lot of people, particularly in the cities. And that's, you're walking down the street, it's a nice, you know, ju late June, early July day, you're walking down your sidewalk or on your way to work, and boom, out of nowhere, this crow comes in the back of your head, maybe hitting you, probably not, but it's spooky, it's scary, and you don't understand why this has happened to you, you were just minding your own business, and why are crows so mean? These are the emails I get. And the answer is, of course, that crows uh, are not being mean. But um, I think most of us probably can guess the answer. Why might a crow be particularly irritable in the summertime? What's going on in the summertime? They're breeding, exactly. So the thing about crows and a lot of birds is that their kids actually leave the nest before they're completely flighted. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. The reason for that is even though we often think of nests as being homes and these safe spaces, they're not. An open cup style nest, which is what you know, most bird, robins and most songbirds use, incredibly dangerous. It's not actually a very good strategy because as soon as a predator sees that open cup nest, it's it's all over. So there's this, there's this tightrope walk that happens towards the end of the nestling period where birds are, are big, they're more robust, they can't quite fly yet, but they are quite literally sometimes sitting ducks. Well, they're not even sitting ducks because ducks are smart enough to leave the nest basically as soon as they hatch, but songbirds, they stay there, right? And so sometimes either from their own accord or because of a predation event, attempted predation event that happens, they leave the nest before they can fly. Now, at this point, they are often very close in size to an adult. They're about the same weight. Now, their um, primaries haven't come in yet, so their tails are often short, and to the trained eye, the differences are very obvious, but to, to the untrained eye, they might not be. So somebody's walking down the sidewalk, they see this bird, I don't know, it's a crow, whatever, they're not really paying attention to it, but it's a kid. And they think that they're just walking by, minding their own business, but to the parent of that offspring, what they're seeing is an incredibly big, powerful animal approaching their kids. What else are they to do? They don't really have that much at their disposal to protect those kids besides the swoop. And so that's what's going on in the springtime. Now, I can understand, as much as I try and encourage empathy during this period, I can also understand that this can be a very unpleasant thing to experience, especially if it's happening consistently. So if this is the case, this is happening to you or anyone you know, my best advice is carry an umbrella. I, I know it sounds silly, but most of us have umbrellas. It's really effective. And yes, you will look like a weirdo carrying an umbrella on a beautiful June day, but when people ask you why you're doing this, you can give a great spiel about how you are a friend to wildlife, this is a very small gesture you're making in order to more compassionately share your space with animals, and, and that's a speech that everyone really likes to hear. Uh, if, and you know, as I say, do this because it's, it's a wonderful way just to extend that sense of community beyond the people you share your lives with and to the animals, and also because look at this mom.
this is, this is a horrible, this, she doesn't like this. This is a very stressful period in her life. She just fed this kid literally two seconds before I took this photo. It was begging. It was begging while she fed it. Now she has successfully fed it, and it could not be any closer to her ear, and it's just screaming for more food. So, you know, give, give her a break if you can. And I guess I should add, in case anyone does not know how to recognize baby crows besides shorter tails, a couple things I want to point out to you in this particular picture is, uh, so a lot of baby birds have very specifically covered, uh, colored, uh, colored mouth interiors. And the reason for that is it is a feed me signal to the parents. And if anyone wants to, I strongly encourage you to Google Gouldian chick uh, nestling, or Gouldian uh, finch nestlings, because they have these bioluminescent mouth interiors. They're really wild stuff. But uh, crows have these pink mouth interiors, and so you can see the corners. The corners of their mouths will be pink throughout the summer, so that's a really good indication. The other feature is the blue eyes. So they have blue eyes until about September, and then they turn brown. So how many people in the audience have had this experience? Does anyone here have a bird bath, and they maybe find some unpleasant little presents. Yeah, I'm seeing some raised hands. So this is probably the, the other aspect of, of crows that particularly birders find really irritating. What, they put things in bird baths. <laughs> and a lot of the times it's hard things like bread and crackers, but sometimes it's more grisly things like, you know, baby birds or pieces or bones or pieces of meat. And the answer to why do they do this is that it's a great way to incorporate more water into their diet. Uh, for both themselves and during the breeding season for their nestlings. Uh, it helps soften food if it is like a you know, stale piece of garbage they, they took out of the trash can. And as far as what to do about it, crows are incredibly neophobic, meaning they are scared of new things. So sometimes something as simple as just like putting a, a glittery rock in your bird bath can just kind of freak them out. But in general, it's, you know, that often doesn't really work. And so I just tell people, just think of it as your reminder that you should be cleaning your bird bath every day anyway, because you should be. <laughs> now, they are irritating, but I think far more than their, their being obnoxious, they are amusing. They are beautifully amusing. How lucky are we that the animals that live so closely to us do these behaviors that are so deeply charming? And I think play is probably top among those behaviors. So there are actually seven different kinds of play that crows, in, crows and ravens and other corvids engage in. This is probably the most popular on the internet, snow play, particularly things like sliding. And boy, do these birds love to sled. They like to slide on their bellies, down inclines. These are hooded crows, which are a species native uh, throughout Europe, but common ravens love to do this as well. They will also, I'm not kidding, they will have snowball fights. They'll pick up balls of snow in their feet and like throw them at each other. It's adorable. But um, these are animals that, that really enjoy play. And there's not that many birds that we've documented engage in play, particularly as adults. And in fact, that's true across wild animals. Play at adult levels is very rare. So it's pretty cool that we get to see these birds do this. Probably my favorite personal story, I was doing my field work in Seattle. All over Seattle, one of the ornamental trees that they have planted are these sweet gum trees, and they make these kind of ping pong sized like spiky balls. But after a while, the spikes get worn off, and they're just kind of a nice round ball. And I saw a crow, it picked one up, and it would fly it high in the sky, and it would drop it, and then it would go, and it would catch it right before it hit the ground. And it did this as many times as it took for me to get my phone out of my pocket, at which time it promptly stopped. But I promise this did happen. Now, the next thing I, I think really compels people is that these birds are incredibly smart. And that sh sadly shocks us. <laughs> it did for a long time because, of course, people did not think birds were very smart for a very, very long time. When I say people, I should say scientists. Uh, scientists did not think birds were all that smart. And the reason for that is that their brains are very different than the mammalian brain. And so we just kind of wrote them off. We dismissed them. We said, well, they don't look like our brains, and therefore they can't work as well. But actually, it seems like maybe they work a little better. Um, 
And one of the most interesting things, I think, the way we can summarize this is, you know, there's a vast evolutionary divide between birds and mammals, and yet they have achieved very, very similar feats of cognition. Now, measuring an animal intelligence is an inherently fraught topic because how do people in all our hubris possibly figure out how to define intelligence and then apply it to other creatures? And one answer to that question is, you're totally right, it is really hard, but the other answer is, we're doing our best and this is what it looks like. So we have developed what's called the Cognitive Toolkit, and that is four features that we have been able to demonstrate are contingent upon higher levels of executive function and cognition. These are not things that can be attained through things like uh, instinct or trial and error learning. And these four pieces of the toolkit are causal reasoning, so an understanding of cause and effect. A really good example of this is um, gray lag geese. They nest on the ground like a lot of other waterfowl. And if one of their eggs rolls out of the nest, the female will go and she'll use her bill to, to push it back in. And that's, that's a really good idea, because if she doesn't do that, that egg will die, because it will go unincubated. And so you could look at that behavior and see, like, yeah, OK, that's, that's, see how smart she is? She knows she has to keep her eggs in her nest. But the rub is that you can put anything outside of a gray lag goose nest. You can put a golf ball or a rock or an orange, and she'll be like, oh, OK, and she'll just roll it back in, because she doesn't actually understand the relationship between what she's doing and why she's doing it. She just is responding to a stimulus. Imagination is the next component, and as people, we kind of take this for granted because imagination is such a routine part of how we live our lives, but it's actually an incredibly difficult thing for your brain to do. It takes a lot of cognition to be able to imagine scenarios in your head that aren't really happening. The next feature is flexibility. So um, that, that gray lag goose uh, is, a, is a really good example of that. So that's another, uh, that's a case where she can't show any flexibility, right? She can't sort of take in the new information and be like, oh no, I don't actually want an orange in my nest. Uh, but corvids, on the other hand, they can take in that new information and then use it to, to adjust their behavior more appropriately. And then the last feature is prospection, which is just a fancy word for mental time travel. So I want to give you some examples of how we've actually demonstrated this in the corvids. This is one of my favorite experiments. This looked at imagination in common ravens. And this took advantage of the fact that, so ravens, like crows, hide food for later. We call that caching. And the problem for ravens is, as, if, as a caching species that's also social, they run the risk of their foods getting stolen from them. And so we know that they behave differently if they think that they're being watched. And so this study capitalized on that. So what they did is they had these hand-reared ravens. They have them in this big aviary. They built two rooms that they separated with a partition. And in that partition, they drilled a little peephole. So the first step is they put the raven on one side. They put its handler on the other. The handler calls to the raven, holds up its treat. The raven goes, goes up to the people, kind of looks through it. And that's giving that raven experience with peoples, with that they can look through that wall. The next phase is they put the raven back in the partition when they give it a really high quality food, something it really wouldn't want to get stolen. And then on the other side of the partition, they put a speaker that's just playing raven calls. And the reason for that is that eliminates what's called the gaze effect, meaning the implication of a bird being able to directly see a competitor. And in half the trials, they closed that peephole while the audio was playing, and in the other half, they opened it. And what they found is that birds, uh, during the trials where the uh, partition was closed, the peephole was closed, behaved like they were alone. But if the peephole was open and they were hearing those calls, even if they couldn't see another bird, because of course there wasn't one there, they behaved as if they were being watched. Which means that they, had, they could look back on their experience of looking through that peephole and going, I can't actually see if someone's watching me, but I can imagine that possibility, and I'm going to take precautions in the event that that's true. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on their keen abilities of flexibility and prospection, particularly in the Js. And uh, I'll just summarize this series of experiments by saying one of, the, one of the funnest ways that we've been able to demonstrate this is we'll give scrub Js mealworms. And one of the experiments they've done is they have this big aviary, has all of these different rooms. 
They'll give them mealworms, they love mealworms, to cache them, hide them wherever they want. But then after a while, they will start limiting the jay's access to a portion of that room for part of, for half of the day. And so what they're trying to do is establish to the jays, you have access to everything now, but eventually you're only going to have access to this half. And what we find is jays will start to only cache in that area of the room. So they can take those experiences and go, if I want food for later, I know that I'm going to be in a different situation, so I need to change my behavior now. And then the last thing I want to talk about is their incredible causal reasoning uh, skills. This is a, a quick video clip. And before we begin, I want to give you a little context for the particular birds that this video features. So if you've ever heard headlines to the effect of crows are as smart as a small child or crows are as smart as an eight-year-old, uh, one thing I want to notify you of is when we say crows in those headlines, we're actually pretty specifically talking about one particular species. We're not talking about our neighbors, the American crows. Because most of the causal reasoning work that's been done has been done on a species called the New Caledonian crow, which lives on a small island called New Caledonia off the coast of New Zealand. And these birds are very special because on New Caledonia, there are no woodpeckers, which means there's this whole food niche, there's this whole food um, option that, is, that was going unexploited of big tasty insects and grubs hiding under bark, that kind of thing, that wasn't being exploited by another animal. Now crows can't go hammering into wood like a woodpecker can because they would get brain damage, so they had to figure out a different solution. So New Caledonian crows are one of only about five animals in the entire world, including ourselves, that has figured out how to make tools. Now, only about 1% of animals use tools, but that includes a huge diversity of critters, in, from dolphins to fish. But making tools, actually taking something and manipulating it in a specific way, that is a much, much more specialized skill. And that's what New Caledonian crows do. And as a result of that behavior, they have a level of um, physical awareness and cognition that we don't really see in a lot of the other species. And so I, I, I want to play this video, which is going to demonstrate the incredible lengths to which these birds seem to understand the world around them and put it together. All right, can I stay in here? Absolutely. And this one does need, right, need we'll it. Come on then. Send in your mastermind, because it's going to need that. Alex studies wild birds, which he releases after three months of research. This one is nicknamed 007, and it's about to attempt what Alex believes is one of the most complex tests of the animal mind ever constructed. The bird is familiar with the individual objects, but this is the first time he's seen them arranged like this eight separate stages that must be completed in a specific order if the puzzle is to be solved. And if the bird succeeds, it'll be a world first. He takes time to have a look and then starts with the short stick. Stage one. He finds it's too short to reach the food. He then sets off to get the first stone. But he drops it. Another. He seems to be stuck. But then something seems to click. He deploys the first stone. And then another. Got 
got it. The eighth and final stage. Success. Eight individual stages of one complex puzzle completed. That was remarkable. I've never, ever seen anything like it. Of all of the bird behaviour that I've seen, nothing matches that. I can hardly believe it. I'm still just running that sequence through my mind. It happened really quickly. But the immediate question is, of course, how on earth did that crow do that? So, uh, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, it really, like, you know, I know the ending is a little bit corny, but it's true. I, an eight-step sequential um, process like that, we don't see in any other animals besides New Caledonian crows and people. It's just incredibly remarkable. Uh, there hasn't been the, the physical body of a crow compared to an ape, very different, obviously. So sometimes it's difficult to make direct comparison because the way that we... Uh, construct experiments that test their cognition are often dependent on the way that they actually carry them out. And so we, we can often not ask exactly the same questions, but there was a study that came out a few years ago that was the first attempt to create um, a series of tests in ravens that was the most comparable thing to anything that's ever been done in primates. And uh, after making those comparisons, the answer was they are remarkably similar. Their understanding of the physical world, their levels of social cognition, I mean, there's much more similarities between corvids and apes than there are dissimilarities when it comes to their cognition, which is incredible. So the last kind of big feature, now that we've, we've recognized, you know, these birds, they're near us, we can easily see them, they're fun to watch, they're irritating to watch, they affect us in many, many, emotionally in many ways, uh, and they're, they're just incredibly cool animals because of how smart they are. The kind of last feature that I think brings all this together is crows are watching us back in a way that we don't really often see with any other animals. So I already mentioned, we know that crows recognize our faces. This is one of the uh, most important pieces of work that John Marsluff published when it comes to crows, his original facial recognition, uh, rec facial recognition study utilizing the masks that many people are familiar with. And so we know, based on that work, that if you do wrong by crows, they learn your face, and they remember you for a long time. <laughs> and they tell people uh, about you, they tell their offspring, and they tell their neighbors, and the way when I say they tell them, the way that they do that is through demonstrating it. So this moment where a crow is dive bombing a person, when those naive birds are perched in nearby trees watching, that's how they're learning this information, but they do learn it, which is pretty incredible. Now, luckily, they also learn us in uh, more um, friendly contexts. And this is, in fact, one of my, my favorite stories. So there was a gentleman who lived outside of Seattle who, uh, like many people do, fed crows regularly. He had a little platform outside of his yard, and he would put food out there. And one day he was feeling a little cross, and you know he put, he put the food on the platform, and he said, you know, every day I bring you guys all these treats, and you don't bring me anything in return. He goes back inside. And like any good crow feeder, you know, after a little while, he would go out and make sure all the food had been cleaned up. So he goes and, and he's going to go clean up his platform. He sees all the food is gone. But, but there is one thing there that wasn't there before, and it's a little Valentine candy heart that says love. And he goes, oh, no. What is happening to me? <laughs> and so he emails John and he says, this story is going to sound nuts. This is true. Please help me. I think I'm going, no one believes me. What, what is happening? So as any good scientist, John thinks, okay, there's, there's a couple different ways we can explain this. Maybe this guy is making it up. He just wants to get in the news. He's, he's lying. Maybe someone is pranking this guy. His kids are trying to, you know, pull a prank on him. Maybe crows really do understand the written and or oral human language, and we're all in deep trouble. Uh, or maybe it, it's something else. So he, he goes out, and he meets this guy. And after talking with him, it's very clear that he's not making this up. He's, he, the, he, this really did happen to him. And after speaking with his family, it was clear that 
Uh, no one was pulling a prank on him. His kids were out of the house, his, his wife has mobility limitations, and his neighbors hated that he fed the crows. So they were gonna pull some like whimsical prank on him. So that leaves that crows either understand us or option D, which is that we don't know. Now, while I just told you over and over again how smart they are, I am hopeful that they don't actually completely understand our oral language <laughs> and haven't picked up on how to read. Um, so I think the explanation for this is probably something along the lines of um, crows, this idea of gift giving is a very real phenomenon. Lots of people who feed crows report getting gifts. What I can't yet speak to as a scientist is whether those are genuinely gestures of gratitude or if, and, and if anyone here has ever trained a dog, you're probably very familiar with this pattern of behavior, where the, the way you start to teach a dog to sit is you uh, guide you know, a treat over its nose and then it kind of does it and you go, oh, good job, good job, here's some food. And the dog goes, oh, when I do this, you give me food and you continue to reward that. Now crows like to pick things up, carry them around. They're very curious in that way. So they come down to a nice pile of food. They have some piece of garbage they picked up in their bill. And they're like, well, why would I carry this garbage around when I can take this nice peanut that someone has left for me? And they leave the thing behind. You come outside and you go, oh my gosh, the crows have given me a gift. Now you get cashews or, or bacon or whatever it is. And the crows go, okay, so you like garbage. I can do that. So, I, you know, it could, or it could be something like that. But like I said, as a scientist, we don't know the answer. Maybe they really are just trying to say, I like when you do this, thank you, here's a thing. Because they do offer nuptial gifts during the breeding process. So, maybe so. And honestly, at this point with, you know, crows are, I think, gaining a better reputation, but there are still a lot of people who really don't like these animals. So if we can perpetuate the wonders of, of befriending them and inviting them into their yard, your, your yard, I don't think that's a bad thing. Now, I talked a little bit about the facial recognition, and at this point I consider that kind of old news. A lot of people know that crows can recognize your face. But the next wave of scientific inquiry is whether or not they can recognize your voice. And there was a really cool study that came out a few years ago on large-billed crows, the ones we featured in that crow or no game, that showed that not only, and we know that uh, crows can recognize the voice of people that uh, they're more familiar with, but large-billed crows, wild large-billed crows, can recognize the difference between the native Japanese speakers that they live among and foreign speakers, foreign languages like Dutch, which is pretty incredible. These birds can hear the differences between human languages. That is a level of attention to us that's almost a little bit scary, <laughs> uh, but it's just really cool. Why do they pick up on that? We don't know. Maybe it's because that way they can more successfully pick out tourists, which might be a little bit more willing to give them handouts than the locals. We don't know, but it's a pretty incredible feature. And for those of you who maybe don't know this, it's not just that crows are really good at hearing our voices, uh, but they can do a little bit more as well. So ravens are excellent at mimicking sounds they hear. Mischief, can you say hello? Hello. Good bird. He does all sorts of voices. Can you say, hi? Hi. Good job. And sometimes he hears people who have a cold. <coughs> Good job, Mischief. Can you say, hello? No. Hello. He's all excited. But, hi. Hi. Good boy. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. This is a working out, Daniel. <coughs> Good bird. <for> <laughs> they are incredible mimics, and um, most most of the corvids are. The magpies, the jays, the, the crows and ravens. Generally, they only do this level of mimicry in captive settings like this, though they do have some level of mimicry in the wild, but you won't 
typically hear them actually do, doing human voices. Compared to parrots, probably not quite as good, but their accuracy to the way the voice sounds is really incredible. And then the last thing I want to talk about is, as humans, we are very uh, used to explaining animals. And it's a little bit weird for us that crows kind of turn the tables, right? They're really good at exploiting us. And so I've seen more and more, though, that lately we have started to think, how can we use crows? And the butts for nuts idea is the most common way I see this manifest. So this idea happens, I, I, every four years, there's some new startup that says, oh, I've got it. We are going to train crows to pick up cigarette butts in city parks. It never works or lasts very long, but you'll see these headlines every once in a while. Uh, and it's a, it's a complicated thing. I understand why people would be motivated to do that. Um, but I, I think the idea of getting wildlife to pick up litter because we can't figure out how to get people to clean up after, our, after themselves is a pretty depressing notion. <laughs> so for now, I, I encourage, I hope that we can just accept uh, this one exception and let this animal be the exploiters of ourselves uh, rather than the vice versa. So with that, I will end my talk. I'm happy to take any questions you have. And after we're all done, I do have my table set up outside. If you've been inspired and want to pick up any Corvid swag, I have stickers and magnets. Uh, but yeah, I would be happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. So the question was, when we did the imaging study, what was the control? So we did, the control was an empty room. So we, uh, we show the birds either an empty room or somebody holding the dead crow. And then the statistical method we use is, is called a subtractive method. So we basically overlay the brains on top of each other and we see what the difference in uh, where, that, where that chemical landed, basically. And so we don't, the answer to your question is we don't see anything for the empty room. We only see what was the comparison during the stimulus with the activation. Yes? So that, so her question was, what, what did it tell us that it was the prefrontal cortex? So that tells us that they are tapping into their executive function and decision making when they see those dead bodies, at least in that specific context of being presented with this unfamiliar dead crow. Yes. So the question is, why are crows smart? And that is really the million dollar question. Uh, physiologically, the answer is because they have an incredibly large brain relative to the rest of their body, particularly their prefrontal cortex, their executive function part. It's quite similar to our own, in fact. But the spirit of his question, I think, was more of an evolutionary one of, well, why is that? And that's kind of a million dollar question. Um, uh, personally, I really like the social intelligence hypothesis, and that's this idea that being social is incredibly cognitively demanding, particularly in the ways that these birds are social. So like ourselves, they have what we call a fission-fusion social system, and all that means is that they form relationships, they hang out together, they part ways, they come back together. So they're constantly having to keep track of, like, this is our relationship. We don't see each other all the time, but I remember you from back when. Here's our things. Ravens are, I mean, I could do a whole nother talk on like how politically scandalous ravens are. They are constantly watching each other and trying to subvert others' success or forming alliances or it's, it's like reality. I mean, it's crazy. You can make a TV show about it. And all of that, it, I mean, it's just really demanding. Um, you could make an argument that it has to do with their generalist diets. Uh, that's been implicated in cognition, including among people. Uh, animals that have generalist diets often have larger brains because it is difficult to know how to eat different things. But um, 
yeah, I, I don't have a specific answer for you, but it is the one that I would most like to spend my career searching for if someone would give me that opportunity. Yes. So her question was, she had an experience with a young crow that was f repeatedly flying into a tree and injuring itself, it, it sounds like. And she was asking if I have experience with that. No, I don't. I mean, that's not normal behavior. So it might have had some kind of either neurological problem or maybe a vision problem that was I impacting its depth perception. Um, but yeah, I'm, unfortunately, you know, not, not all young crows um, hatch in, in good health and those that don't unfortunately suffer the, the fate that yours did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? What are there in the Corvidae family? So the question is, who all is in, in that Corvidae family? And it's uh, crows, ravens, jays, magpies, rooks, jackdaws, chuffs, not all the chuffs, but most of the chuffs. Um, tree pies, uh, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of different jays in other parts of the world too, um, that are not, uh, super closely, the jays are not monophyletic, they're polyphyletic, so, um, the J, the genus of jays we have in the United States is very different from the ones that you find across Asia, but I think that's, that's pretty, and uh, nutcrackers, uh, which we do have here in Washington. I think that's pretty much covers it. Yes. Okay. That, that's the but where the bothel roost is. Oh, I get this question a lot. So, voice. Voice is a big one. One thing that it would be really interesting, I don't think anyone's done. Oh, uh, the question was how do crows tell each other apart? And we don't quite know the answer to that. Uh, voice definitely has something to do, and in fact, uh, their calls encode a lot of information about age and sex, uh, and to some, some level, identity. One thing that's interesting, though, is so a lot of birds have really, a lot of songbirds have really good UV vil, uh, vision. They can see a lot of the UV spectrum. Crows, weirdly, do not. So some birds encode information in their feathers uh, as manifested by UV patterns. And so one thing that makes sense is, oh, I bet crow, because they're black, right? So they, they probably have all different, no, because they actually can't see it very well. Uh, we don't, I don't know why crows are unique among the songbirds for that, but um, it doesn't seem like feathers are, are that way. So we don't completely know the answer to the question of how crows tell each other apart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this experience of seeing crows in massive flocks interacting with each other in ways that suggest that those two know each other. So how do they do that? And I, I, yeah, I would love to know the, the answer to that question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Roost. <clears throat> Great question. So yes, it is uh, 
So crows can roost year round, but in the breeding season, which is spring and summer, uh, adults are mostly gonna stay on their nests, on their territory. So uh, roosts will continue, but it will be pretty exclusive to sub-adults or unpartnered birds. In terms of what they look like, they prefer riparian areas, which means habitats that border streams and rivers. So wetlands are really popular. Uh, but in Seattle, we have two big roosts. One of them is, is up at Bothell, and that's an example of a wetland roost. The other one is down at the Ikea. So they also often like, you know, big box parking lots that have uh, cottonwoods, willows, those kinds of trees is kind of the decorative tree because they, they seem to like deciduous trees in particular for roosting sites and, and maybe it has something to do with the structure, it's just more appealing to them, but, but that's often where you find them. Yeah? Uh, oh, very cool. Wow, yeah, that, he, he's telling the story of a black-billed magpie roost in Walla Walla that comes in the wintertime, and I would really like to see that. <laughs> Let's make that festival, too. <laughs> yes. So she was asking why ravens fly upside down, and the answer is that's actually a territorial display. So when they do those barrel rolls, that's the way that they signal territorial boundaries to one another. Crows can also, they're capable of that, and they'll do it for fun, but ravens do it more as a, as a visual signal. Yeah. Yes. So her question was, what do you call a group of, of crows? And animals, we do have lots of different names. She gave murmuration, which is specific to European starlings. Uh, crows, the, the term is murder. And ravens, the term is unkindness. Uh, so <laughs> suffice it to say, these are not scientific terms. Now, for any, any of these group terms, they're completely colloquial, all of them. Flamboyance of flamingos, parliament of owls. I don't know who makes these up. Uh, clearly, it was not a panel of people who liked corvids very much, <laughs> uh, but that is, that is what you'll, you'll see them referred to as. I just would refer to it as a flock. Yes. They, so the question was, uh, to what level do crows mimic other birds? And the answer is not to the same level as like a starling or a mockingbird or anything like that. They, they do it a little bit. Every, t every once in a while it pops up. They also have a lot of na na quote unquote native sounds that are, are their own thing, but that happens to, by coincidence, sound like other animals. Like they have a, there's no formal name, but they have a group of calls. We always called them wow calls. They're kind of these soft murmurs. One of them sounds a lot like a cat. I don't actually think it's an imitation of a cat. I think it is just a genuine sound that crows make that by coincidence sounds like cats. It's the jays that are more of the mimics in the group. Um, Stellar's jays, blues jays will, will mimic a variety of raptors. For example, though, uh, the most recent research on that has demonstrated they don't actually do it to scare away other birds, as is the common explanation. Um, there was a study that came out in 2017 that demonstrated that they don't usually make that sound around food. Uh, and they primarily make it during the earliest part of the breeding season around their mate. So it might actually be more of a sexual signal than a way to deter birds off of the bird feeder. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. Yes? Um, 
So the question is, do crows change roost sites? And the answer is yes. Though the specific example you gave of seeing crows move from the arboretum, so that there's a reason that happened. And a big part of it is that um, when we started construction on the, the new bridge, uh, that ran through Foster Island, which is where the roost site historically was, and so they, they moved as a result of that. But they also naturally move, and in fact, that southern roost moves around a lot from year to year. The northern Bothell roost is now very consistent outside, right, you know, right on campus, but they do move sometimes for a variety of reasons. Yes, I'll tell how about one more question because I know we're getting a bit late and then anyone who I didn't get to, you are welcome to come find me after the talk. Yeah, oops. Yeah, so her question was for the New Caledonian crows, was, was that completely, you know, was that completely spontaneous or did they know the steps beforehand? And the answer is yes. They knew the individual steps beforehand. They got training on dropping rocks in order to, you know, release the stick. Um, but it was the first time they put that, put it together in that sequence. Now, one thing that New Caledonian crows were able to show spontaneously was the creation of hooks. So one of the most famous experiments involved Betty, and she was given a, a cylinder that had a little tiny bucket at the bottom with a piece of food, and she was given, her and her cage mate were given the choice between a hook and a straight piece of wire with which to ex extract that bucket out of the cylinder. Her cage mate, um, to her chagrin, uh, took the hook and flew away and didn't really feel like participating, but uh, she was very hungry, <laughs> so she took her little stick and poked it in there, and the researchers are probably like, you know, birds are always ruining these experiments. And then, to their surprise, she took that piece of wire and she bent it, wrapped it around the cylinder, creating a hook, put it in the cylinder, pulled out the bucket, uh, and she had no prior experience with wire before that. So that really blew us away, uh, though now we know New Caledonian crows actually make hooks all the time. They are the only non-human animal besides our, they are the only animal besides people uh, who make hooks. And so they, they're actually quite experienced with that, but, uh, but yeah, they, they did, in that particular experiment, they did have experience. All right, thank you all so much. Please feel free to come find me if you have more questions, and enjoy the festival!